Welcome to the first episode of Dinner with a Winner presented by Second Swing Golf. Today we are in Dallas, Texas at Hard 8 Pit Barbecue. And we have a special guest with us today. It is Mark Brooks and he wanted the full Texas barbecue experience. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go through, get some food here at Hard 8. We're gonna talk to Mark about his favorite preferences when it comes to Texas barbecue and then discuss his career, winning the PGA Championship in 1996 and a whole lot more. So let's go meet Mark and get some food. Mark, good to see you. Good to see you. So, some Texas barbecue, huh? Yeah, this is the real deal. Yeah, this is the real deal. Let's go check it out. We're gonna I... introduce you to some barbecue. Okay, okay. So, what is the secret then to enjoying Texas barbecue? There's gonna talk different meats, different sauces, is it both of those things? Well, Texas barbecue starts with the brisket. Okay. The br brisket's king in Texas. Yeah. And it's all dry rub. There's no wet yeah. when they're cooking it. So they're letting the natural fat and the quality okay. of the meat tenderize it over a long, slow, smoky cook. Yeah. Probably, these are probably 10 hours or more, right. all these briskets. Barbecue aficionados would snub their nose at the chicken, but it's right, awesome. Right. No, yeah. It's, so, yeah. you know, basically it's brisket, ribs, sausage. Yeah, okay. And all the different places have their own unique sausages. Yeah, okay. So, well, I'll, I'll follow your lead here. Why don't you, uh, we'll, we'll place an order for what you need. All right, well, we'll get started here. We got brisket, not all lean, okay? We need a little fat. We'll do a couple of ribs and then uh, mix the sausage. You got jalapeno? Yeah, a little bit of both. And that's the trifecta. Wow. You're gonna like it all. So you gotta have, that's potato salad. Okay. Love all, all made in house. And here's your coleslaw. The coleslaw. So if you were gonna make a sandwich, you would actually meat, barbecue sauce, coleslaw. Okay. And wheat bread would be uh, sacrilegious. Okay. You, have, <laughs> you have, have to have the white. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> you gotta have a few onions, a couple of jalapenos. Oh my word! Look at this. And these are all sour pickles. No sweet. Wow. Okay. Talk about a guy in his element right here. And now right, we're at so the, now we've got a couple sauces here. And we hot got, and spicy, I'd go traditional. Yeah, I'm more of, I'm not, the spicy thing is kind of, usually kicks my butt. Well, we've so. got jalapeno in the sauce. Yeah, so that's gonna be plenty for me. You can't have it without, over the brisket. Over the brisket. Okay. So the only thing left is this cream corn, which we're gonna get okay. two of those, because it's sinful and it's awesome. <laughs> jalapeno sweet corn. Okay, perfect. Okay, they're known for this. There's your sweet oh, corn. Word. Uh, if there's a, no room, I can you carry can that carry part. Those. Okay. And it's either sweet or unsweet tea or cold beer. That's what you have. With okay. It, okay. Sweet tea or unsweet. Sweet tea. or unsweet and cold cold beer. Uh, Two drinks. The... All right, so Mark, you got to show me. Uh, we got well, we've got the so, whole platter here. So if so. you come by yourself, you're you probably wouldn't have a tray. You might if you're going to spend a couple <laughs> hours, you know, watch a game, have a couple beers. Yeah. Uh, this could easily be one one person's let's call it early afternoon and going into a nap but <laughs> we got plenty here to share for two this is tip you know typical way you'd, you'd go and uh, i'll just start like if i was gonna and fingers are good and, and I, I will comment on the hat the yeah, cap yeah. it's almost obligatory to eat barbecue eat, eat in texas with, with a cap, cap on, on. <laughs> cap okay, on. okay. <laughs> you're not being rude and the only rule is that uh, really, if you go cap on, you got to keep your bill out of your sauce. Okay, right? uh, no, that's no, probably a fair rule. Yeah, no hat like in the it. sauce. So this is your, this, this is the rib, and okay. like I said I'm going to use fingers, so that's how no, I that do perfect. it. Oh, Okay, so you get a rib. Okay, and then we're going to move over here. You're going to get two pieces of the bread, okay. so you can build your own wrap. Okay, and actually, we're going to go with two ribs because there's no way you won't eat them both. All right, we did two <laughs> kinds of sausage. So we did their traditional which is, it's got a little, thank you, it's got a little kick, and then this one is the jalapeno. So it's got okay. jalapenos. It's gonna have more of a kick? It definitely has more of a kick. Okay. And uh, so you're gonna go two of those. Okay. There's your pickles you can grab yourself. Yep. Now here's the coleslaw. And we okay. went traditional, so let's, before I get to the brisket, which is the king. Yeah, yeah. 
There's your coleslaw. This is your famous jalapeno infused cream corn. Yep. We got the, it's Beans. really sort of a barracho style. It's not a, you know, ranchy, you know, out of a can beans. I mean, yep. these are done, you know, in-house, yeah, yeah. drained, cooked overnight. They actually have brisket and sausage trimmings okay. that are mixed in there, okay? <laughs> yeah. And okay. what I do with my beans, I'll just, I'm cutting to the beans. I take the sauce. Oh my word, okay. And I give it just a little bit of drizzle. All right, and I'll do that. Here you, you know, go, go that. ahead. I'll take that. So okay. I kick the, kick the beans up just a hair. I don't do it to anything else. I'll pull mine over okay. here so we can start revealing the, yeah. the brisket. So we went with a kind of a mixed cut. And okay. you, a lot of places now, you can either get what they'll call a lean lean slice or you can get a fatty slice. We kind of went for the middle. Brisket's not brisket if it doesn't have some fat. Yeah. And it's kind of, of, kind of worthless. Not, it's, you're going you're to indulge a little bit. So, and you can see it is literally falling apart. So. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to use a finger to put it up here. So of course. here comes your brisket. Okay. So that's the king. Yep, yep. King of Texas barbecue. It's where it all started, basically, okay. the brisket. They figured out how to take what used to be a pretty cheap cut of meat. They figured out how to trim it, leave the right amount of fat on it. And they finally, over years and years and years, figured out pretty much how what, what temperature, yeah. what woods to use, and how long to smoke okay. it and cook it. So it, th this stuff's all 10, 12 hours, slow cook, a couple okay. hundred degrees, and it's ridiculous. So... That's your start. What are you missing? Okay, you so I gotta get some pickles. I'll grab some pickles. Okay, get I'll, some just pickles. Go, I'll just go. Some people, yes or no, the, hands, the onion. You know, we're going with the hands, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. And the pickles cut the I'll a little bit of the some, fat. Grab some onions here. There you go. Nothing yeah. crazy. And I'm gonna double dip here. So I'll build you a quick wrap. So if you're so inclined, and sometimes they'll yeah. use you can tortillas, corn flour. Sometimes are used for this. So I right, will. So I'll copy it here. I'll wet the wrap. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay on this plate. I'm going with brisket. Okay. That's probably a little much. I gotta be able to wrap it. Okay. Right down the tube. There we go. Now this is kind of the odd tradition. I like it because it cuts it. I take a little bit of coleslaw and go coleslaw on top of there. Oh, okay, okay. On top of the brisket. Yes, saying. sir. Okay, okay. So I got beautiful white bread. I've got okay. sauce soaked brisket. Then we're gonna go with a little bit of the a coleslaw. A little bit of the coleslaw. Okay. So now I've got the sharp, tangy barbecue sauce, the beautiful brisket. Yep. And then I've got the Okay. Perfect. The contrast with the this is the sweet sour meats. Yep. Meets the meat, man. And so it's gonna be messy, and that's what it's all about. And that's where oh, you're you keeping in one slice of bread, is what there you're doing. There you go. Oh, and there, there okay. is your wrap. Wow. And you have to tilt. You okay. gotta have some tilt. Yep. You gotta have a little, you know, little side bend in the neck. Yep, yep. And you go bite. Mm. And that's it. And that's if you want to get phenomenal. really dirty, then you start dipping. My word. You yeah. dip, 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 bite, dip, bite, dip, bite, and it's gone. And then you have got a, you've got a good start to your barbecue. And then you just make another sandwich, right? You won't even want it for some of it. Uh, because you don't want to get too full on the bread. So it's a good mm. start. Sometimes it's a finish. Wow. Phenomenal. And it's a phenomenal way to go. This and is that, fantastic. This is not a sandwich. No. Well, that's why I was thinking that first, because I went through and grabbed bread. And I was like, oh, we're making a sandwich. This is, this is you would not, yeah, this would not be classified as And a you'll want this. Yep, yep, I will. There you go. Thank so you. That's why they do it in rolls. That was great. That was great. And so you got started. Yep. It's just the start. Now you start adding all the things, mm. and you know you'll you'll eat. This is not a meal where you eat one thing at a time and finish it. You're going to go back and forth, take yep. a break. Sure, sure. And in about an hour, you'll be you'll be <laughs> done. You'll be done. So enjoy. All right. Well, Mark, I'm I'm very full. Uh, that well, was good. That was fantastic. Uh, I I didn't really know what I was going to. What was going to happen when you had the bread and then you started wrapping it up and everything? But I got to say, you you know your way around a barbecue place. So. Well, this is a good one. <laughs> There's a lot of good barbecue in this state. Yeah. And they, they, these guys do it right.
-hmm. So that was your fold over. Um, yeah. Fold over. And I don't know about a wrap. But you didn't fold yeah. wrap. Well, it, it was, yeah. I, I've never actually had a slice of bread and folded it with any type of anything in there. So that Really? Was, that was good. That was okay. that was the great great way to start doing that. But, uh, that was my plan from now on when I whenever I have to come back down here for the store for second swing whatever it might be I'll stop by and I'll do that. So that's um, awesome. So kind of segueing into your career a little bit. Um, talk we got to talk about a champions dinner because that's sure. kind of what this whole dinner with a winner thing is sort of. I got it. About is getting a winner in here, having them pick a meal and and. It's similar to Champions Dinner, and you had one as a PGA champion. So we alluded to it kind of um, off air um, that you had you were up at Winged Foot. So not quite Texas barbecue up there. Well, no, there's but there's more. But, so Bobby Nichols yeah. is kind of is basically credited with starting the past okay. Champions Dinner in the '60s. Got a mid mid '60s, and it kind of caught on, and it was going pretty full steam by by the time I was fortunate enough to win the PGA. Obviously, you host the following year, yeah. and unlike one tournament, we move. Our tournament, yeah, the right. PGA moves every year, and that year was at Wingfoot, mm -hmm. and I wanted barbecue. I definitely <laughs> wanted to bring in the Texas barbecue, Angelo's in Fort Worth, which is a long-standing, you know, traditional barbecue joint. It used to have sawdust on the floor. Oh yeah, uh, you know the best cold, you know, schooners of beer and juice you could ever imagine. Anyway, we figured out it was going to be too tough to get it up there. Yeah. And they they weren't going to rebuild their barbecue pit in uh Mamaroneck, New York. So <laughs> I defaulted and I went with a traditional steakhouse. Mm -hmm. And we I did large pound and a half bone in prime ribeyes. And then all the trimmings of a traditional steakhouse yeah. and I, I still get compliments on on choosing a pretty straightforward dinner. People, yeah. I, I think I had to have a fish entree as, as a backup, but I wanted to be barbecue, but we couldn't get it up there. Oh, sure, sure. Well, uh, it's it's fun to go back, and that's always kind of a question that I ask people when they jump on. For you know, it might be members of the Second Swing team or other guests that we have on the podcast. Anyway, is I always ask, what would your champions dinner be if you? you know, one, you know, major Augusta or PGA, whatever it might be. But now I actually get to ask somebody who did win. And as you get older, after you've done it, you would, you know, like in my case, it would be a no brainer. It would either be barbecue or Tex-Mex. So yeah. that's what it, that's what it would be. So that's what we had today. We had some Texas barbecue. So um, that's correct. So talk about that PGA. We'll go right there to start. So um, I think, you know, we're at Valhalla and we did some club testing this morning, actually, which um, tune into those videos as well. But we, looked at some of the clubs you hit. So I think what, I guess, here's the question. Going into that week, did you feel good about your game? Or like, I what did. is I was, so, I was having a good year. Okay. So I'll back up to the session today with uh, the little railer, yeah. you know, call it strong forward that I used. I have not seen, I haven't really pulled that club out and looked at it for yeah. tw 25 years, 20 plus years. And the first take this morning when I set it down there, of course, I, I don't play much golf anymore, but I set it down behind it. I said, this is going to be tough. <laughs> I know. I mean, it, looked, it, looked hard. It, too. it looked hard to hit, and it proved to be hard to hit. Yeah. But that year in 96, I actually won. I, I started playing better golf in, like, 1988. Okay. I mean, I made some big swing changes after the mm -hmm. 1987 season. Finally figured out I couldn't do it on my own. Got some help and got video. And yeah. so I was able to see what I was sure. needing to change and turn what used to be would purely feels, I got to turn it into something that felt real and was yeah. real. So that was the big change. And then I had a couple of, some really nice years, like 91, 92, I had a bunch of top 10s, a lot of, you know, a lot of contention, uh, won a couple times uh, through there. And 96, I actually, I, I won the Bob Hope, which would have been in January, late, mm -hmm. you know, let's call it late January. I won the Houston Open, which would have been in April or May. Okay. And I was probably second or third, maybe top three on the money list. So, yeah. I mean, they probably didn't count me as a favorite, but I certainly would have been one of the top, say, 15 yeah. or 20 players. Okay. So it wasn't a shock to be in contention. Yeah. Because I'd already, you know, does that make sense? You know, no, well, yeah, totally. Well, this came out of the blue. And I had those experiences, and they're more frightening. <laughs> because you kind of feel like you smoke and mirrored your way, or you putted yeah. your way into that last group, and now but, will, it, will it hold up? Probably not. But looking at your past results, you... I mean, nobody should have been that surprised that was following golf, the way you were playing up to that, a couple wins. I would agree. You had been in contention, and, and your name was up on the top of the leaderboards often. <laughs> the other thing I'd add, you know, again, because we get to have time to go a little deeper, but it, I, I really, 
My game didn't look like on paper it would fit a Jack Nicholas style golf course, you know, which should have been high fades into the greens. But I had some unusual success at Muirfield in Ohio, okay. in Columbus, oh, Ohio, sure. yep. which is, you know, one of his, it's, you know, his baby. And what I, I think what happened, I was a pretty decent iron player, pretty good distance control, even though I didn't have a high trajectory. So I had some pretty good success of getting the ball into the right sections of the greens mm -hmm. at Muirfield. And I didn't win. I didn't really come that close to winning there. But, you know, I had generally no trouble making the cut and yeah. having a good good tournament there. So Valhalla was a Jack Nichols yeah. golf course. And built not too long after that same time frame. So there were a lot of similarities in okay. the shot values that were asked. Right. Okay. And so I liked that going in. And probably to my benefit, Playing in August, you're going to have softer bent grass greens. So I wasn't playing rock hard greens. And I mean, you can even see it from the tape. Balls coming in there, get, it's getting soft, the blow softening a little bit just because they had to keep them a little bit moist. Mm -hmm. We did have rain one day. So a lot of factors kind of kind of bled in there to make it probably, luckily, a good week for me. And I yeah. hung in there, and, and to be honest, uh, I've seen their tape read, you know, of course you've seen the, you know, the yeah, replay you, a few times. It. There literally were five or six guys with a few holes to play that had a good shot at winning. And to my benefit, their demise, several of them actually boogered the, butchered the 18th hole. Yeah. And I ended up making four to get into the playoff. Mm -hmm. But when you, you see it back, you go, whoa, boy, you, you were pretty fortunate. Yeah, you're probably, you're probably looking at the, the last couple holes of that, and you're, if you're watching it for the first time, you're like, this, you know, Brooks is probably out of this thing. He doesn't have a chance. And then as, as guys well, maybe it was VJ Singh up. and not just Kenny Perry. There were several players at, in '96 at Valhalla that had a shot with yeah. a few holes. I to saw play. Phil was a leader at one point too. I'm sure. Um, so yeah. now, mentally, are you? Well, I guess down the stretch of a major, do they have? Is there leaderboards out there? I imagine. And Damn like, right. Are you are you looking at them all the time, or are you? Yeah, not okay. all the time, but. Like how closely if was, you were yeah. playing it, again, this is that smoke and mirrors thing. If you didn't feel really good about your game, you might try to duck the boards. Mm -hmm. You might try to not to see. If you're playing good, it, it it didn't bother. You shouldn't bother you to see where you yeah where where what's happening. Right. I suppose you know, if you have the ultimate confidence on. in your game, you're and not then, worried about where that is. You just I don't know, know about ultimate confidence. It's just a matter. Are you going to let you know that piece of information affect how you yeah, perform? I and suppose. the more fragile you are, the less, you know, the more blinders you want to put on. I mean, I've always, it, my dealing with boards goes way, way back. And I won't even get into some of the stories. These are guys that even had content, had, were in contention at the British Open. Okay. Back in the, actually this would have been mid sixties. And they were talking, you know, he had this horrible experience. I go, and he t explained it. And he actually lost two British Opens by a shot. At the British Open then they didn't really have leaderboards only up by the clubhouse mm -hmm. okay and they had a walking standard yep, bear yep. that had the twosomes yep, had the right, score had just in the group and the way you knew if you were leading coming down the stretch were if the bobbies with the hats on started following your group and he said on about 16 green the bobbies showed up so he so he was thinking and he's looking and around well no he looks he goes he's this he's telling the story it's an awesome story and he's he <laughs> He looks up and he goes, well, I'm beating the guy I'm playing with, so that's a problem. <laughs> he was like three ahead of the guy yeah, he yeah. was paired with. He goes, that's a problem. And he proceeded to hit two of the worst seven irons on the next two holes that oh, he no. said he ever hit in his life. So he was trying to tell us never look at the boards again. Okay, so it was really funny. But, and a wonderful man. And uh, I played golf with his son at, at, at Texas, Paul Thomas. This was Dave Thomas who turned okay. into a fa famous golf course architect. But he told that story. Yeah. And this is also the guy that also gave a hole in a Ryder Cup because he had the chip yips. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've heard I this do, story. I remember that. He, you yep, know, yep, Mr. Yep. Green, he had to, was going to have to pitch over the bunker, and he looked at it for about five minutes, and he finally decided he ended up giving the guy the hole. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually do remember hearing about that story. That's... And he did it because he knew he was going to, like, chili dip it or double hit it yeah, or whatever, it was gonna, to, and it was going to destroy him for the rest of the round. So the like, one hole's forward. worth it. So he picked. <laughs> But anyway, so back to the leaderboards. I determined it was worth seeing. I mean, you'd look, yeah. I mean, you know, especially situational. Right. I mean, you know, how would you feel if last hole and you 
you got wrong information, for example, or you didn't look and you you could easily reach the green right. too. You could have played the shot differently. Yeah, and then you laid up, hit it in there conservatively, and you end up losing by one. You go, you could hit a four wood on the green and right. two putted and maybe won the golf tournament. So yes, you I like I think you should know. So and then right after your playoff, they actually switched the three hole format, right? Oh, and by the way, let's go back to that. You don't need to worry about it on Thursday or Friday, really, okay? Unless you're trying to make the cut. And I'm just saying the leaderboard thing. Things change. Right. When you're going 72 holes, that's the other part when people talk about last round or the other thing, I, I always broke it down. It's like you're lead, leading or in contention. Oh, you still have 25% of the tournament left. You know what I mean? That would be like, well, the, the round's going to end after 13 holes. No, right. no, no. Same thing with a 72 hole golf tournament. Even though some guy's leading through three rounds, he's still got 25% of the tournament to play. So it, it looks more intense than it is at the end, but. You know, that the, the old saying, the, guy, the two-footer he missed on Thursday is just as important on Sunday. Unfortunately, that's kind of true. Yeah, I suppose. It is. It, it is true. Because it does. It can change so rapidly in a, no doubt. But a I, few holes. Not to run off, but that was, I was already having a good year, so I wasn't shocked, and things worked out. Yeah. Thank, thank God. Yeah. I mean, that's – I mean, winning a, a major tournament like that is certainly – a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment to, to reach really the, the pinnacle of golf there. So I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, hey, I mean, a major win is a major win. That's the, the, you, that's yeah, a certain at, upper, upper echelon of, of golfers. Course, the older I've gotten, the more you end up, you know, getting interviewed or talking about it. And yeah. certainly, the last few years with all that's gone on, you know, and I've done some television work. You, you end up talking about, it, you know, how what's the difference? Why is it important? Yeah. And, and it's just it has a historical permanence to it. Yeah, oh, totally. And, you know, half the tournaments are more that I won. Well, not many, but let's, whatever, the seven, they're gone. I mean, they don't even exist anymore. Does that make, oh, you know, they're, yeah. they're just, they're total, total. Like, there's different sponsors, new I courses. Mean, we don't even have to start naming names, names yeah. but if you went through the last, you know, 30 years, there's a lot of golf tournaments that don't exist that lasted, some maybe four years, but some lasted 15, yeah. 18, 12, 10 years, and they're gone. And that's okay, and that's fine, but that's not the case with the majors. Right, exactly. All right, it's not the case, and... And that's actually fun next year because the PGA goes back to Valhalla next year. It so does. And, uh, I'm sure you'll probably be featured in some of the... I will not be featured. Be featured it's, in some it, of the, the, it's just the, the memories. They'll show highlights and stuff like it's that. It's the trivia but. question. You can win a lot of money because no one will get it right. You <laughs> said, well, they've had they've had four major events at Valhalla. They had a Ryder Cup in 2008. Yeah. We won. Yes. Tiger Wood, uh, Roy McIlroy won in 2014. Yep. And Tiger Woods famously won in 2000. He beat Bob May in the playoff. And he goes, and there's another one. So you go Tiger Woods, Roy, Roy McIlroy, Ryder Cup, and then they'll, they'll never get me. But it's kind of fun. So I can, I awesome. stump my friends all the time. You know, it's been three guys win there. Tiger, Rory, and <laughs> who's the last guy? They, they can't get it. <laughs> That's awesome. But anyway, it's fun. Um, so the I think the other piece of your career that um, I wanted to mention was the U.S. Open, um, the the playoff there. Completely different playoff format, by the way. So. Um, what was that experience like? Um, I mean, obviously you're probably very disappointed that it didn't end up in a win, but to have a chance at a second major, you know, a few years later. Pretty, pretty different, even only five years later, but pretty different stage. Yeah. Uh, in my life or golf career, I, you know, like a lot of guys started having a little bit of back trouble mm -hmm. and, you know, thank, thanks to the reverse C <laughs> growing up, you know, Mm -hmm. Let's call it 60s, 70s golf swing style. Uh, I finally developed some some back issues. You know, the old herniated disc. I got pretty fortunate. I never had leg leg pains, but it, it was uh, something I had fought. And that was in 2000. At the end of the 2000 season, that's when it hit me. And so I spent months and months and months, and you know, dealing with that, and to varying degrees of success, finally kind of balanced out how to handle it, how to deal with it, and so. By 2001, I'd had an okay year, but I was still worrying about the back quite a bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it was not a total surprise. I love Southern Hills. I mean, yeah. I, I played a lot of my golf growing up at Colonial in Fort Worth, and there were a lot of similarities. Okay. You know, P Perry Maxwell had a lot to do with both both golf courses. And so there was always this kinship and, you know, relationship of the two clubs uh, between Colonial and, and Southern Hills. So I'd played it quite a bit as a kid growing up, you know, teenager. Uh, loved the place, got, you know, just, it, I was playing good that week. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember I, maybe a month or two earlier, I'd figured out a set of irons. Oh, okay. That, that helped a lot. 
and it was exactly what we were talking about earlier today about launch. Yeah. I found some that I could actually launch in the air, and I'll even give them they were TA fives if you remember okay. that. Yeah, club. I do. I little do. little simple cavity back, yep. kind of low low CG, and it changed my game. And I probably did that in April, maybe you know okay. after the Masters. So yeah, a couple months later then. A couple months later, and it was it was phenomenal. And I mean, I remember certain shots there. You know, like you go. And I don't remember seeing the shot, but I'm like, man, that's is because we played the senior PGA in 19. Yeah. It, it had been redone, but not, mu not much change. And there were certain par threes, like we were playing from like 212, 215 back, you know, in 01. Sure. And I'm like, you know, I went back and I'm like, man, I, I hit the screen every day, yeah. like with a three iron, you know, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't anymore do that in a million years now. But it was like really interesting that little flashbacks. Right. Uh, so, that's, you know, that's kind of that story. 96 is way different. I mean, I've been playing pretty much the same stuff for a long time, but I clicked onto something and I was 40 uh, in 2001. I was okay. born in 1961, so yeah. I was 40. And with the back and everything that had gone on, I, I, if Retief would have gone ahead and four putted 18, because he almost did, <laughs> I might not have ever played again. Yeah. Seriously. Kind of gone on, I had actually, on top. Yeah, it would have been drop. no doubt. <laughs> that been only only my two. wife and a couple friends knew, but you know, here we are. You know, yeah. Twenty two years later, I'm not doing it anymore. But you know, twenty years later, I was still you know beating it around. But yeah, I, I was ready to. It was like you'd won the, if you'd won the PGA and that five nine. You know, not. I'm not supremely yeah. athletic. Probably the the back talented. Was I'm like, concerned. are you kidding? I yeah. mean, you know, how many times do you need to climb Mount Everest? You know, I'd have, I'd have done it twice. <laughs> yeah. Like, Dude, the third time it'll kill you. Right. Okay, and it kills a lot of guys trying to get back up there. Oh yeah. Even in this game, mm -hmm. trust me. Mm -hmm. You know, they either have a mic on or doing something else. <laughs> so, hats off to the guys that keep their, you know, keep their mental yeah. stability and some kind of balance and focus and can do it. I mean, Bernhard Langer, you know, I don't, he's not human. So. Yeah, that's how about how impressive is that? He's. It's not. He's not human. He's still. How old is he now? He's, he pulled it, in the parking lot over here. I was there last night for yeah. the past champion dinner up here at Frisco and. This courtesy, you know, luxury SUV pulled in, and it was Bernhard. Yeah, and he was in the passenger seat. Really? Yeah, and this was not a self-drive car, so nice. Does that give you the tent? Yeah, Bernhard. Yeah. He didn't. He he was driving this by ESP. Yeah. If you get that, it's supposed to be a joke, but it was crazy. <laughs> and he got out. He looked like he was fifty years old. Yeah. So that's he's. I mean, or forty-five. I think he's still out there every year, kicking it at Augusta. He's. You know, I, he made the cut just a few years ago. But so he's, he's still... He, he figured it out up here. Yeah. You know, a long time ago. Yeah. Double, triple yip. Had yips several times. I know he jumped off of the subject, but man, he's a good one. He definitely had the yips. He yeah. would tell you he had the yips. Probably still has the little little pieces of, you know, little inklings of it. But, I mean, it's... He's the one they ought to cut his brain open and study it. Because <laughs> that guy right there, I mean, it's The it's concrete amazing. yips is not... A, I mean, that's probably... It's brutal. Well, yeah. Most people don't. Right. Uh, you know, once you get a certain age, like chip yips, or you've seen it, I mean, they'll have to go to another method. Right. Like completely, like putt, chip, one hand. You see now guys actually going cross-handed. Cross-handed, for sure. I, mean, I don't it's, know where uh, we got off on that. Ooh, but anyway. <laughs> well, let's change it then. Let's go this way. Um, Throw all your days on tour, do you have a favorite player to play that, with? That came from the yeah, yeah, Everest yeah. fall. Yeah, that's right. We were all over the yeah, place. You'll fall, you will fall. It's a fall is deep. Uh, favorite player to play with in a tour event? Wow, Tiger Woods. That's easy. Yeah, yeah, easy. Just what? What was that? I mean, what was the reason for that? Just watch him. Because I only got to play or... with Mr. Nicholas a couple of times in competition. Yeah, and uh, even though, luckily, a little, you know, I got on tour in '84. He won the Masters in '86, famously. Oh, yeah. yep. You know, he he was still competitive for another probably three or four or five years, but uh, I didn't get paired. He didn't play much. Okay. Uh, Tiger, because I won my major in '96. Yeah. And you're sort of in this category, and by default, you would catch Tiger some. And of course, honestly, we took, we laughed about earlier today, like, how many times have you played Tiger? I said, yeah, quite a bit. I'm in, and I said, I wonder how many times I beat him, like zero, you know, maybe once. <laughs> right. Single rounds, you might clip him, but not, yeah. for, not for a week. But anyway, he turned pro in 96, yeah. famously at Milwaukee, you know, smashed it, whatever, 315 yards down the middle. Yeah. He made the tour championship that year. Okay, I mean that he turned pro in the middle of July. That's right. Middle That's late right. July, and he yep. played in the Tour Championship. So, 
Uh, and I, I was obviously got to play there. And that was at Southern Hills, by the way. Okay. okay. And a couple of shots, one in particular that he hit there. I still remember this day. I used to talk about it all the time. And, of course, he had steel shafted, you know, little head. Right, right. Kind of yep, not yep, too yep, dissimilar. Yep, 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 but right. I was whack trying mm-hmm. to whack 210 in the, in the trailer today. Excuse me, in the bay. But I got to play with him quite a bit. And so de- definitely my, my – that would be by far the number one. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want to play with it? Well, so at some the point, the, the crowds got to be huge. That you are not, you're not even curious about the shot? Well, I'm. Oh, of course I'm curious about the 50 shot. degrees, wet, tight, actually pretty dormant lie. He had, you got to remember, this is 1996 in November. He had 274 to the hole on the fifth hole, par five. Okay. I had hit it about 30, whatever, 30 yards behind him off the... I had laid up with a four wood, okay? That club, yeah, yeah, ripped it. I had about 90 yards left for my third. I'm walking down, you know, and he's waiting. You know, got group, two guys up on the ground. I, my cat is, what's he doing? Why is he waiting? Yeah. He's got the wood out, you know, got, got the head cover off of this three wood. He said, man, I guess he's waiting on the green. Maybe he'll make some noise. So we got my yardage book out, because I wanted to know. <laughs> And I calculated up, he had 274 to the hole. And again, it was 50 degrees. This is 1996 so, with a soft a lot of golf ball. That, it flew four steps behind the stick after they cleared the green. It flew 278, stopped about six feet past that. He had about a 15-footer for three. And it was like case closed. So that was? That was 96. So the equivalent today, that would have been... You, a, that would have been probably a 300-yard three It would be. It would be similar to Justin Thomas's shot at Aaron Hills, the 292-yard yeah, three-wood that he hit in there, about five feet. Point being, and then I played with him enough, and his wedge game was... Oh, around the greens, uh, he's always been a magician. Mm-hmm. He just had a lot of trouble with his distance wedges. Primarily, it was launch. You yeah. know, just, and it, it, there was technique issues. But he launched it too high, and... Fast forward, like, say, I played with the Memorial a few times. Yeah. And it, it was just kind of all over the place. I mean, he hit five iron. If it was like a nine iron through a four, two iron, when it took off, left his face, he knew within a couple steps where it was going to land. Yeah. Not true with a 90-yard wedge or a 110-yard wedge. Okay. It might come down 15 yards too far. Anyway. And then fast forward, I've got paired with him somewhere in, a couple, in like 2000. And where, you know, we get out. Who are I'm playing with? We're watching him. I mean, one of the few guys you watch. You can yeah. ask that. But, and... I don't know, let's say the fourth hole, he's got this little 90 yard, and the thing came out about like that, and we yeah. both looked. I, I looked at the guy I was playing with, I said, we're in trouble. Yeah. He's like, well, I go, this is a joke. Because yeah. his distance control was so tight. He figured that part out of his he game. He figured that part out, and honestly, game was over. The game was, that was his hot stretch there where he game was basically over. didn't lose for a couple years. Once he figured out how to control his distance, Dustin Johnson did a similar thing. If yeah. you, you know, if you ever really go back and watch early DJ, balls up, balls up, right. balls up. Once those wedges went like that, Man, he was he got hard to beat. He yeah. got real hard to beat. Got started getting in the fairway, and his wedges got awesome. So yeah. Well, uh, let's well hold on. So that's a question I'm curious about because like you talk about tuning the trajectory, tuning stuff. When you or Tiger or anybody 20 years ago, 25 years ago was trying to get fit or fit themselves, is it is it really just going to the range and hitting shots and looking at it? Is that really all it is, or was there more to it? That would depend on how much talent you have, athletic ability, face awareness, face awareness. Yeah, yeah. Which is both launch, lo- you know, loft, de loft or loft. Right. And the, you can learn that. Uh, it's today def- you can take. You a know, I mean, there, you're but... a, you're a hell of a player. It's there's technique involved, mm-hmm. and. My point is, so, you, so you're asking me, so I could go set up a barrier, okay, like with a ceiling, put a, put a lid on it, yeah, and hand a kid a 60 degree sandwich or 56, put him just a reasonable distance behind it, and just say, don't come home until you figure out how to hit this club solidly under that wall, under that ceiling, okay? When you, when you get it under the ceiling and it's got some quality to it, you can come home. One kid, it might take an hour, one kid, yeah. six hours, one kid, it might take a month, another kid might never be able to do it. So, I mean, I'm dead yeah, serious. Yeah. So these so are the that's the kid you got to walk back in, and yeah. now you got to get into the explaining of the shaft lean and tag. Right. It gets pretty wild, you know, as you know. But most of the athletic kids will figure out how to get it under that right. wall. It's and a lot then, of. And so then you go that way. So I've done this to them. Now I'm going to do this to them. Okay. Yeah. And 
when they when the ball flies really good, you're doing it right. Yeah. You don't need to do anything else. When the ball flies really good, you're doing it right. If you can do it repeated. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not a random. It can't just be one random good one because that that truly was luck. I, like, I'll give you an example. I, I have all my kids, including my college, or even tour guys. They're working on a shot. I, I make them hit three in a row. You can't move to the next shot till you hit three in a row duplicate. And you go, and then my saying to them is, the first one was a guess. The second one was lucky. The third one tells me you know what you're doing. Okay? Okay. And I begged them to never hit random shots. And I learned this stuff very early on. I think I got it from my team sports background, you know, even when I was young. I mean, you're in an organized practice. There was no, you know, working out and then a random shot up. I right. mean, are you kidding me? You right. know what happened then? You ran the bleachers. You <laughs> right. came down, decided to random chunk of three up from, you know, 30 right. out. No, 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 no. You're running the bleachers or the balls are going to get put on the rack. When they said balls are about to go to the rack, you know what that meant. Right. You're about to puke, man. <laughs> You're about to so run a heck of a lot. I learned that, you know, we messed around. I'm not saying you don't have fun, but it's like very few shots where you just randomly strike it and let it go where it goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you're practicing with a purpose. It's not just... 100%. Yeah, that's 100%. exactly it. So, but how, you can have fun doing it. And But, you know, something I see it all the time. The kids are out there, four or five of them. Everybody does it, even the adults. Oh, yeah. And they're on the range, they're whacking balls, and they're talking, and they turn around, and then they just flush one. Yeah. And you go, what'd you do there? And he goes, oh. I have no idea. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. it's it's pretty, it's fun. Right, right. Um, so segue back. Tiger Woods hit very few random shots. Okay? Uh, I, I can't. I imagine didn't. Bad was yes. Someone like him, he's laser bad shots, focused the of whole course, time. But oh, yeah. random zero. Yeah, he's not messing around, especially if it's tournament time. I'm sure he's that pretty dialed in. Um, now, when when Dad's got the wind machine and the rain machine on you, and you're in your high chair. And you're having right. to do that just to get your food down, much less hit a golf shot. You're going to be tough. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, some of those there's bit you see in the documentaries and yeah, you know, the, pretty, the history of, of how Tiger was brought up. That that'll that that's what the result is. You know, no you, doubt. When you do that, discipline, tough love, love, yeah. love, love. But yeah. but there's some discipline in there. Oh, absolutely. Um, so today, obviously, now it's so the the equipment's different. The launch monitors are different. Um, how I guess is there? What's your take on how? That's all progressed. It's so tech-based now, everything. Do you think there's something lost with maybe older um, traditional techniques? Well, you asked or... me, okay, I'll, I'll do it quick as I can. So you asked me earlier today, how did y'all know? Yeah. And I made a smart aleck answer, but it was true and I mean yeah. it. I used my eyes. Yeah. So I watched it fly and I got a pretty good jet. You've done it a million times. You can stand there and watch, you can guess pretty close. I know you can. Oh yeah, I know. I know. With, I, with no track man there, it takes off, and you go, and you'll get within a couple hundred RPMs almost every time. You will. You'll get the, you'll get the launch, spin. You 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 get the curve. So what I tell them is, you can learn using the machine. I call it the machines. If you're working on a specific thing, like your pass really bad, it's yeah. a nice aid, and then go double check yourself. You know, uh, or I'll play a game with a kid. Maybe he's not getting down. You know, they're not going down enough. Say with a sandwich or an iron. And I'll just play the game. I'm like, all right, you're at 1.2 degrees down. Let's get it to five. Yeah. And they sort of start figuring it out. Does that make sense? Starting to know how that so feels. A, you go, I'm actually using the machine to become a more organic teacher. Okay. okay? Yep, I see. More, more holistic, organic style. You figure it out. Here's the goal. Here's the target. Go get it. Sure. I'm not going to go, oh, you need to lean forward. Do You figure it out. How are you going to get that club to go down, down more? Yeah. You know, are you going to do it this way because that doesn't work? You can do a little, you know, they start figuring it out. And then I'll tell them when the ball flies right and the numbers are pretty good on here, yeah. you're doing it right. Yeah. You know, that's enough. That is a little bit kind of like it's 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 how our fitters do it, use the num the numbers too in the in the For bay. Sure. It's like they're there's guidelines that they want to get the golfer into, and then it's kind of up to them. Say, all right, I have to change the shaft, I have to change this loft, make this adjustment to the driver, and I have to figure it out for the player because it's not necessarily their job to fix the swing. It's make that swing work for this this equipment. And so that's their way. But that's a fine line. Yeah. So when the pretty athletic looking person who actually is, once they grip it, walks in and they got a 15 left, you know, 12, you know, 10, 12 down, oh, yeah. 15 like left, this. eight iron, and the face is, you know, whatever, 20 degrees open and they hit an eight iron about 80 yards. I think you're obligated to explain to that person, oh, yeah. we need well, to yeah, fix this yeah. and y'all do it. I yeah. know you do. Yeah. So yeah. 
you know, before the guy, in 10 minutes, he's hitting that eight hour instead of hitting it 115 yards, they're hitting it 160. Yeah, and then we always get the question and then too. They're, they're, like, they're wow. wondering what these numbers mean. And it's like, well, this is because you swing way out to in. And now you're seeing that minus 12 on there. For your I'll give you my numbers I'll work pad. on, okay? The ones that, are, that make really matter to me, because we're on this deal, face and path. Yeah. Face and path. That's, I mean, it, you, I preach face and path. Because you can see a draw or a fade based on those two numbers. <laughs> well, or a straight ball. Your delivery, does, you know, your delivery is going to, that's your path. Yeah. Okay, period. Once it's going in delivery, it's the path. And then you got to adjust the face. The other, only other thing I, I'm big on is I call it structure, and I steal from the best teachers in the world, and I've got a couple of favorites, and I steal everything I can get from them. And it's just structure, like the bony part. You got to get if you get set up pretty darn good, pretty darn good with pretty decent ball position, then the athletic movement is learn how to load that load that structure. If yeah. you can load it, releasing it gets pretty easy. Sure. Does that make sense? So yeah, I'm yeah. real I'm real big on structure. Getting mm -hmm. the person to set up decent. Yeah. And then now it gets dynamic. Now we get to, you know, play the fun games. Right. And you know, I mean you're I've watched you swing and hit tons of shots. You're just awesome at loading and unloading. And you know, if it gets out, your sequencing is out. I know you know a couple drills you can do, yeah. get right back in it. You do the nine to three, you'll do you'll step drills, you get it back like that. Uh, but that's what I do. I try to keep it organized, logical, which is hard. And, you know, use the word simple, but logical meaning if, all right, I'll back up. So this is the long one. <laughs> we weren't allowed to ask, not really even allowed to ask why. Why is in what? The word why. If your coach said, I want you to run into that wall head first. Seriously. You ran into the wall. Okay. Or you said, how hard? Or, you know, yeah. if he said, hey, guys, I want y'all to run over into the wall. You go, well, head first or chest first. And if he gave you the choice, you you know, smart guys. Yeah, yeah, of course. Chest. My point is, we didn't ask, we didn't want to know why. You, we figured out why later. Okay, you know? Yeah. But when it comes to the golf swing, the same thing was true. If that coach said, you know, you need to do this, you didn't say, well, why, am I, why do you want me to do that? It's a little different now, you know, technology is part of it, YouTube, mm -hmm. all this access to videos, thing. they want to know why. And yeah. so I've, instead of fighting them, I'm like, I try to tell them why. Okay. Okay. Why do you load here? Why do you do that? And then it might be able to stay in a chronologically logical way for them to think about it. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they can fix themselves. Oh, I mean, I mean, I'm, this is rambling, but it's like ultimately, if I teach them the why, as much as the how, they might be able to help themselves. Yeah, and that's true at all ages. Because all, if you're a, a great teacher, you're teaching that person how to actually teach themselves in the long run. That's what you're trying to do. That's the yeah. ultimate goal. They don't need me anymore right. after a while. Right. I'm just there for moral support, mental health, yeah. you know, yeah. confidence building. The rest of it, they they sh they can kind of do it themselves. I mean, because we have tools now, yeah, to keep up with it. You know, we couldn't but see they, ourselves. They'll know how to teach themselves. You could. You're metrics. young. I couldn't. I couldn't see myself. You know, throw a club down and all that. I mean, we didn't have video. Right. So uh, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Sure, but that's sure. that's my goal. That's what yeah. I try to do. Well, so let's kind of wrap up with so like, what do you you know the things that you're doing now in golf? Because you said you're not really playing as much anymore. But I don't play competitively you've, at all. You've mentioned the teaching and you've mentioned some broadcasting. So are those things kind of like keeping you busy. I think I also saw we're, maybe some course design. Yeah, we're a little doing bit too. we're doing some course management okay. design. Okay. Is those things keeping you busy. Time to get back into it. Well, that's, that's pretty much what you're between, doing between. Right if you said you can teach serious players, and yeah. I mean serious, meaning serious about golf. Yeah, I yeah. don't mean like one handicaps. I mean. So it's serious about getting better. Yeah, yeah. Serious enough to like give it a little effort. Yeah, yeah. Do a little homework between the two week lessons. Yeah, okay? yeah. Okay. You know, if I said I need you to do like a couple minutes, like man, at least do a minute. Okay. You can cheat, but it's like I don't want you to come back and you're exactly where you were. <laughs> you know, I don't want to live with you to get you better. Right. Okay. Um, which reminds me of another great saying, but uh, and do golf course. You know, manage. You know, manage a couple of places and and golf course design. It's that's my favorite thing. Yeah, that's awesome. So. I can't let you go without this. So this is, it's actually, it's apropos because we just finished at Oak Hill and it was a famous story on one of the Harmons. Okay. And assistant had worked there a couple summers. 
and he saw Mr. Harmon going to the practice tee. And I know y'all probably heard this, but I'm going to repeat it because it's awesome. Okay. And he kept, he'd go down, it was 15 minutes. He's doing, this kid's doing hour lessons. He's making probably 20 bucks an hour. This was a long time ago. And he got Mr. Harmon to go down, and in 15 minutes, he's back in the shop. And he finally one day got the guts to say, Mr. Harmon, how are you able to give these lessons in like 15 minutes? And he said, he said, thought about it a minute. I'm sure he told it before, but he said, he said, son, when you go to the doctor and that doctor gives you the prescription, he doesn't go home with you and watch you take the medicine. Pretty good. Made, made sense. Yeah. It's pretty good. The doc, he does not stand around watching you take the medicine. So he had gone down. He did. He saw what he needed to see in ten yep. minutes. He gave, gave the guy it, the, prescription. Gave the prescription. He's done. <laughs> That's My awesome. Job is done. I'm not gonna stand out here and watch you. Awesome. So now are you doing that with yours, or are you not quite um, that level, or? I'm not watching for thirty minutes. No, my, okay. my lessons last way, way longer because I I don't like doing shorties. But yeah, man, it's just awesome if you yeah. to be able to pick a swing and pick one thing. I have trouble picking one thing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I so. suppose. But I mean, clearly a golf junkie, right? So I'm a, um, I'm a golf junkie. Yes, but Mark, uh, thank you. This whole morning, this into the afternoon now, we really appreciate your time. Um, we've got videos coming on YouTube with the club comparisons. That'll be fun. And of course, all the the barbecue today was fantastic, and I appreciate you showing me how to properly enjoy the the Texas barbecue today. Well, so, you're welcome. Let's do it again. So thank you so much for your you time. You got it. We'll do awesome. it again. Okay.